Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Since 2009, HRN podcasts have been exploring the wide world of food, beverage, and agriculture. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. We talk about food, we talk about music, with musical dudes, finger on the pulse, snacky tunes. Hello and welcome to Snacky Tunes. I am one half your host, Darren Bresnitz. We are so excited for the annual return of the LA Times 101 Best Restaurant List, which is dropping December 6th with both a list in print, in digital, and one of the best food parties of the year. We sit down with restaurant critic for the LA Times, Bill Addison, to talk about this year's list, the story of the LA Times dining scene. And we also share some music that he puts on when he's cooking for friends and family during the holiday season. And then we dig into the archives for a performance from three of our favorite Brooklyn artists, Avoir Simone. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy Snag Tunes here on Heritage Radio Network.
Bill, thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to join us, especially during the holiday season. Uh, welcome to Snacky Tunes. We appreciate you stopping by. So good to be here, Darren. Thank you. So, you know, I feel like with Thanksgiving, giving everything in this week, you know, my mom, who has been my my mentor for Thanksgiving, we start actually prepping in like the summer. You know, it's like we get the berries, we freeze them, you know, we get the, the the pumpkins and everything during October, you make your puree, it's all steps. And I feel in many ways now, like with the 101 best restaurant list, like this is the time to it starts percolating and it starts popping up and it's the announcements. But I know that the preparation starts in advance. When do you really start thinking about the list? The big answer is that I'm never not thinking about this list. Love it. I'm I'm already <laughs> on to thinking about the next list, even with this one sure, um, sure. just in the in the can, um, in the in just having finished, you know, going through the the publishing process. Um, but I, I know what you're saying. And mm-hmm. the honest answer is in July and August, mm-hmm. my editors and I start talking and it's, it's my byline on it or, or, you know, who, you know, my predecessors byline on it. I know we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute, but yeah. it's such a big team project. You have, sure editors, copy editors, designers, social media people, digital designers. So more than ever in this world of media and publishing, it just takes months and months and months. And and for me, you know, there's a lot of anguish. I mean, yeah. This is my my fourth year doing this list and and the number 101 feels smaller every time. So hmm. it, I go into definitely into dry. I definitely go into dining overdrive um, <laughs> at, at this point, I'm, you know, and it's kind of that balance where I need to be writing, but I also need a clear head to be, yeah. you know, um, to be eating and thinking and, and yeah, it's a lot, but I'm, I'm so aware of the privilege of being able to do this. Well, I have to imagine, you know, you, you have a meal at some point of like a new spot or you go back into a beloved place and you're like, Oh, they've kicked it up a notch. And you're like, where does this sit on the, like, there's no way it's not just like this constant horse trading as you, as you go out and dine. And, you know, for those who are not as familiar with the list, especially our listeners outside of LA, it's his 10th year started by the legendary Jonathan goal. But, you know, if you could share a little bit of, of why it started and, and how it got started, um, and its continuation. Uh, I'd love for you to give a little color and background on it. Sure. The 101 Best Restaurants project from the Los Angeles Times um, did start in 2013 at the Times, but really it goes back to the 99 Essential Mm -hmm. LA list at LA Weekly, which Jonathan Gold started with his wife, Lori Ochoa, who um, had come back a few years earlier from being second in charge at Gourmet Magazine. She was given the the opportunity to be the editor-in-chief of LA Weekly. And um, because Jonathan and Lori were from um, LA, they... I think they missed the city living in New York and Jonathan mm. was writing for Gourmet and and they uh, came back to settle into Los Angeles and cover the city and raise their kids here. And I think that that list started in part, honestly, because of the magazine brain that they had been steeped in a few mm. years earlier, mm-hmm. right? Um, because... At that time, gourmet is such a force in American um, food culture and food media. People forget. Right. People forget RIP. um, 2009, October 2009 was when it folded. But um, they would do every three years or so a list of the 100 best restaurants in America. Right. And, you know, Los Angeles is America. There's so much here. 
that I think they looked at the city, looked at how long Jonathan had been writing reviews about the city and thought, we can do this. And it was definitely ahead of its time. I think it it did make a huge splash. I was new in my career in 2005. And I remember looking at this list and we'd seen the national lists before, but there was just something so special about this Los Angeles list because it covered the breadth of the city. It wasn't just the fancy white dining places, yep. but it was the regional Cantonese restaurants in the San Gabriel Valley. It was exploring the breadth of the regional Mexican restaurants, the riches of Koreatown, all that goodness expressed in in one very well written list and i think food media and publications of all sorts looked at that list and it informed literally where we are today and and how we think about how we present restaurants. i mean just last week esquire dropped its 40 top restaurants uh sitting at close top was young bond society um exactly yeah so great and you look at, I mean, I remember when um, Alta sat at the top of the list of downtown LA and everyone bon went a, like, Bon Appetit. Bon yeah. Appetit. Everyone was like, yeah. Los Angeles. That was, to me, a very big turning point. But the point I'm sort of getting at is that like all these publications still focus on a national level. Um, and arguably, three or four cities, maybe Houston, New York, yep. could have the breadth of Los Angeles. But living here and eating here, I don't think any of them could maybe really capture the same national interest on a, such a specific list that LA is able to do. Why do you think that this list has had its staying power and its relevance over the years? Well, I guess I'll jump into that from what you were, <clears throat> excuse me, from what you were just saying earlier. I was Eater's national critic for five years before I took this job at the Los right. Angeles Times. And so I was making those kinds of lists, yeah. right? It was my job to make the, the list of the 38 essential restaurants in America every year based on my travel schedule, which was full time for three weeks or more out of 11 months of the year. And we started doing these regional lists yep. where it was – um, the South, the Midwest. Mm-hmm. I did one for California right before I took this job. And I I think, you know, I don't need to get into conversations about um, like what the best dining city in America is. Of course, of course. But I've lived all over the country in my, my 20 years doing this, I was a critic in Atlanta and San Francisco mm-hmm. and Dallas before covering the whole city. And, and the reason for the success of this list is just literally Los Angeles. Yeah. You know, it is, this is such a, an incredible organism of food culture. It's always changing It's never stagnant. There are so many facets of it to think through, even with the pandemic, which brought Mm -hmm. so many challenges. You know, I I know it's too fresh to be talking about silver linings. I I don't I will always hesitate to to of course, of course, to frame it like that. But there were so many pop ups that came out of um this crisis moment where chefs who were out of work or other people who had done other things than work in the food industry who were out of work say, I'm just going to try this and put it on Instagram and see what's Mm -hmm. happening. And now we're in a place where the audience that they found, you know, is willing to follow them as they kind of start these bootstrap restaurants, you know, nobody who was running a pop-up that, that I think of, you know, two years ago was suddenly moving into a, you know, 3000, you know, glamor palace in Hollywood. They found the most affordable place that they can to rent. They've often done some of the renovations by themselves, but Mm -hmm. people know now what 
they have in them. And it's, it's beautiful to watch that translation into a more permanent space out of the ephemeral in the same way that it was beautiful to watch Wes Avila take his stand that was Gorilla Tacos yes. and, yep. and make it into a food truck and then, you know, make it into a permanent location. And, and then that evolution, then Wes leaves and starts other projects, you know, that's, that's Los Angeles in a microcosm, but the, it's the quality of the food too. It's also extraordinary. Sure. You know, you can, you can say, I'm sure you can pinpoint this in every city, but Los Angeles is, is special. Maybe it's enormity makes it special. Mm. Certainly it's proximity to the farmlands of California make it special. And also there's that thing, right? That kind of sense of possibility that mm -hmm. seems special to Los Angeles. So this sense that you can try something and there are enough people who are creatives too, or either steeped in, in the ways of creative minds that they're willing to say, yeah, I want to see what you're up to putting together these flavors that I didn't see before or expressing something from your background that's so specific that even if you think you know Thai food or Oaxacan food, maybe you're you're trying tastes or textures or some sort of specificity that you haven't known before. I mean, look at Bridgetown Roadie as a perfect example of yes. of pandemic and then it topped national lists. Yes. And you know, how many people had had really that type of food? or even knew about that type of cuisine before. And does that happen in any other city but LA? Does it happen without the pandemic? And pro the answer is probably no. Um, and I think there is this and thing. I think oh, I yeah. was going to say living in New York and eating in New York. I was like, oh, I'd hear about this thing up in Queens. I'd be like, I don't know if I'm going to Queens. I don't know. <laughs> but here it's like, well, I'm getting in my car anyway. What's an extra like 10, 15 minutes to have the best banh mi, the best, you know, sushi, like who cares? Like I'll go, you know, oh, there's this Malaysian curry on the West side. Sure. Like, let's just get on the 10. I'll figure out the traffic. We'll make it work. It won't be that bad. And that expanse, but also that idea that you've bought into the expanse by living in LA and having a car or willing to yep. travel. Yep. You're like, all right, there's space. There's space for this. It's like, at this time in history, the great jigsaw that is Los yeah. Angeles is just made for the pieces to be fit together to create a picture of uh, an astounding singular dining culture. So you brought up a good point earlier about how when looking at the restaurant scene, especially in some of these national lists or even in looking like rankings, they are cut from a very similar cloth of just like, all right, like I walk in, I know the music, I know the vibe, even if the cuisine is different, like I know what the server is going to say, I know the patter. And that is not this list. This list really does. I mean, look, you're going to see three, four star expense account restaurants, and then you're going to yes, see, you, you know, meals for under 10 bucks that you'll, that you might dream about more than that expense account meal. That too. But absolutely yes, that means that the parameters are different, and it makes the job so much harder. So, in putting this list together, are you curating it in a way that you're trying to tell LA's dining scene story of that year? So you know that these restaurants played a huge part of it, and that's what's going on to it. Or are you trying to tell a different story about all right? Here's like a point system that we figured out, and here's the matrix. And that's how we're actually going to tell this story. And these are the actual, the top 101s because they actually got the most points out of all the other restaurants. Well, I'll start by saying that there is no official ranking system <laughs> or score sheet. It is all in my head and my uh, very disorganized Google Sheets where I actually showed it to a colleague and she was like, who's making all these mean comments in the margins? And I was like, oh, no, no that's just me talking to myself. Sorry. Um, but um, yeah, the, the list is absolutely meant to be the, the intersection 
embodying excellence and conveying the essence of our food culture. Mm. And that's really important to me. I don't, this list is not about tokenism. You know, mm-hmm. I, I want every place on here for people to be able to walk in and go, yeah, that's delicious. Okay. That dish that he mentions or something very close to it is really cool. I get what he's talking about. Yep. So it does, you know, celebrate, highlight the pluralism of Los Angeles, but it's also about where you can eat really well. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that just comes back to the point about Los Angeles. I, I know for a fact that other cities that have these long lists, I'm not sure by the time you get to 68 or 69 that like you're really eating something super yeah. terrific. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. You it was worth the drive. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. You might be eating something that says something about the city and that's great. But, you know, the, the restaurants that I have listed at 101, 100, 99, like I would happily jump in my car right now and yes. eat something very memorable at each of them. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's take a quick musical break and then we come back i want to talk about um a little bit of the process for this year's list how you're returning back to the ranking after last year's pandemic launch and then um the event itself which to me i feel is like the unofficial la culinary scene holiday party um Ah, we have a song from the archives here on snacky tunes on heritage radio network
Welcome back to Snacky Tunes. We are chatting with Bill Addison, restaurant critic for the LA Times, talking about this year's 101 best restaurant list. And, you know, last year you guys got back in the game mid, pre actually Omicron pandemic, but who knew? It felt like we really snuck one in there. Um, But you didn't rank last year, um, which, you know, you had also done after the year that Jonathan passed. and I completely get it. I think the whole industry uh, was appreciative they didn't rank, but I definitely did hear some chefs at the event thinking that that was a ruse and they were going to get the list and like and it was going to be ranked. So I still felt like that there was some desire from some people who were like, oh, I wish this was ranked. I wish we knew where we were on the 101 list. Um, okay, what's so interesting about that, Darren, <laughs> is that <laughs> I have heard that story so many times. Is so I a- guess... <laughs> I'm like you guys. Ju- you guys people, are here. You're, yeah, all the restaurants are here. Like, thank God the the industry survived. And they're like, but were we like? Just tell me, like, 37, 53? So interesting. Yeah, I mean, I heard that right after that <laughs> event. And I guess you know, for people who don't know, I'm still doing my best to kind of keep a low profile. I know, and yeah, 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 you know, anonymity in the age of of. 2022 and restaurant criticism is is all but dead but i just still like the idea of going into a restaurant and having the same experience as everyone mm-hmm, else mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. the people who make it their business to know what i look like know what i look like and i'm i'm grateful for the ones sure who don't. and even there is one chef um who i love speaking of uh the pandemic who ran a a pop-up and I walked into his restaurant and I picked up food as myself. You know, it was, it was hard. it's much harder to create fake Venmo addresses than to have. Yeah, I was going to say, you don't want to correct wire so, fraud and things exactly. like that. Yeah. So I, I mean, I guess I was wearing like a ball cap and sunglasses when I would pick up that food. I wasn't trying to be in disguise, but I walked into his restaurant three times and he never blinked. He didn't recognize me and I was so happy. Anyway... I, Anyway, that but event, it, I yeah. heard that there was kind of this collective like, ah, oh, we wish we were ranked. And I was like, God, I, you know, I, I mean, well, sure. Okay. Sure. So we are, we are and, I get, and I get why you didn't rank. And I'm sure there was some like altruism in there, but also the paradigm. I know you said there's no point system, but like during the pandemic, it was even just like, what is a a restaurant, like what is a food service? Everything's redefined. Like when I can literally get Vespertine at home. Exactly. Um, yeah. And uh, is it one? Is it one hundred and one? It doesn't. Is matter. it one hundred and one? Yeah. You know. Um, but now that you're yeah. back this year, and then you are ranking, and I don't want to say like we're still in the pandemic, but you know, it's like I mean, we are still in a pandemic. We're in a I mean, pandemic, and, and, and endemic or epidemic yeah. is what you know. Um, did that – well, I guess one, what drove you back to the list of having it ranking? And then two, did your parameters, paradigm shift, it's still concerning any of the, the pandemic um, in mind? So literally that point you just brought up about the event and the feedback at the event is why I was like, okay, I guess we're going to try ranking. So it's so funny that you were present for that and can confirm that. And and the answer is I felt both always aware of the effects of the pandemic and the structural systems in the restaurant industry that are always broken uh, around staffing shortages, both in the front of the house and behind the, you mm-hmm, know, in the kitchen mm-hmm. and supply chains and cost of ingredients. I think about all of that. And I hold in my, my arms too, that we're all back in dining rooms. And, yeah. Yeah. and I am, I, you know, this is on one level as well, uh, a consumer service, right? Yeah. I am, I am, 
doing this for readers. So if, if everyone around me is back in dining rooms, I'm too back in dining rooms and thinking about things through the lens of both where the industry is and kind of the excellence that's being presented to me. I mean, look, if I get a, a surly server or if a special runs out at 6.15 that sounded really good that I want, I'm not getting too worked up about it because I know that things are tough all around. But, you know, excellence also presents itself. I agree. I agree. And I think that, again, uh, I know we were talking a little bit before we started rolling, but like if you're back in the game and you've now made it clear that you're back in the game, then you are open for ranking. I think the thing is what we've seen, though, is that there has been a new, I don't want to say category, but like top level food, incredible level food that still isn't available in what you could consider a dining room. You know, there's and there's a lot of, you know, and and um, I imagine without knowing the list and not seeing it, that some of those places that are the new type of restaurants figure somewhere into this list. Absolutely, they do. I think if you're talking about the finer sense of dining rooms, Los Angeles was never known on a national level for its for its plethora of exceptional white tablecloth mm-hmm, fine dining. Mm-hmm. Of course you could find it in the Beverly Hills restaurants. Sure. In the, you know, in the the Palisades or Brentwood or wherever, you know, people with a lot of money want that kind of service experience. But you know, what is LA fine dining? If if it's everything, mm-hmm. then if I'm narrowing down the everything, it starts to me at a sushi bar mm. or at a counter where someone is pulling together incredible things in front of your eyes. Right. That okay. to me is more Los Angeles than, um, you know, than the traditional European style scrape the crumbs off the right, 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 right. Um, even though I am happy to celebrate the the few of those that survived the pandemic because a lot of them didn't. Yes. Yep. Um and and that are truly exceptional experiences. That's part of it. You know that's part of it. I'm not, not going to surprise you and tell you that like, you know, Providence, which was Jonathan's I mean. number one restaurant on the list, he ranked at the Los Angeles Times when he started it in 2013 and he never ranked um, when it was the 99 essential. So I think that was one thing that he was pushed into that, that is now part of the tradition here. So he ranked would rank Providence as number one. Well, surprise Providence is on this list where it falls. You, well, you can tell me whether it wait, wait to December not, 6th, but like, yeah. I'm not surprised. I mean, anyone who's had the pleasure of eating in Providence just knows that you drop that, that experience in any city. And it's, exactly. it's sitting in the top of any list. Yeah. And it fits the way we want to eat in a fine dining setting now. It's it's lighter. It's, yeah. It expresses a lot of different flavor profiles. Um, Michael Chimarusti cares a lot about the sourcing of the fish. Yep. And, yep. you know, it's just all those things. And it's, it's all like, the things. It's all the things. And the service, it should be said, is... Amazing. It's you know, um before yeah. I before, yeah, before I <laughs> it's before really I good here, service. It's really good service. It's really good before service, especially here. if you eat yeah. in other fine dining restaurants in other cities pre pandemic. Yeah. And again, I, I know there's a lot of issues with labor right now, but Providence was one of the places when I when I ate here, I was like, This is the service here is what just takes it to a different level where I've had other great high end meals in LA, but the service doesn't match a more like global thought of fine dining service. Yes. But what doesn't really fly here is that sort of, you know, I don't know if you've seen the menu yet, but that sort of like high pretense, Yep. you know, like it's it's not, you know, the, there's gotta be a measure of warmth here or people. 
just well, call foul to use that's the, why the language yeah. and i don't have to tell you so many chefs from other cities have come here and have just not had any staying power yeah and it's just like there's just a different way that people expect to eat here and fit within the framework and it's great that you have nine restaurants in another city and you have all these accolades but if you it's like when you go to a different country and you're like, all right, you got to partner with someone from this country to make sure that you understand how a restaurant is run. It's like if you're coming to L.A., your best bet is to partner with someone who really understands the L.A. restaurant scene. Mm -hmm. Take what makes you great in other countries and then match it to what works in this city because no one wants someone to come in and be like, we do things a little bit differently in our restaurants and we're going to show you how to do it better in this city. Never works. Never works. Never and works. Yeah, it's it should never be a lecture. It should always be <laughs> part of the conversation, you know. And if you can't if you can't fly with that, I mean that that has been shown over and over and over over and over again. And I um and I will say you know and and part of that too is when um you know we're talking about the specific food cultures that make Los Angeles Los Angeles. So whether it is like the the endemic or or the you know the innate um mexican food cultures yep. here plural 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 the astounding breadth of thai food mm -hmm. if you come in and you say like we're really going to show you something now you know i i don't know if we're allowed are we allowed to cuss on this show yeah you can cuss yeah, yeah la is like fuck you so yeah. what, you know, are you gonna do? what, and, are you, what, yeah. what chinese food are you bringing in that I literally can't drive to the SGV yep. and find something that if I was in mainland China, I would be like, this is the best form of this dumpling I've ever had. Like, what are you going to bring in? And that's what right. makes it so tough. Um, Where is, yeah. When you have a restaurant like Cato that has gone on oh my this God. incredible, you know, growth arc that restaurant landing now in the arts district means that it's closer to the clientele from yeah. the SGV that really makes up a lot of that restaurant's core audience. And, and I think when you're an outside observer to Los Angeles, you don't understand those ecosystems sure. quite as much. Well, and so yeah. you know, I don't know what I, I can't, pretend to assume what a chef who's coming in who or what they expect to be appealing to but you know you've you've got a culture that that knows these foods and and expects something that feels resonant right and if it and not to be talked down to well i mean this is the thing and one i could go on forever about Cato and remember eating my first meal there and being like, I don't understand. I don't understand what's happening. Yeah. I, it, it's, and honestly, the only comparison I had was like, well, Kurt Cobain was like in his early twenties when he was writing those songs. <laughs> so like, why can't the same be for a chef? Cause this is where my mind's blown, but you're already saying if you're a chef coming out of town, here's a hundred one restaurants. Here is a hundred and one, one to a hundred and one that are fantastic meals. You gotta, you gotta best these. You gotta come in and say like they've laid it out. They've laid the reasons out. It's not just 101 best fine dining. It's 101 for all shapes and sizes. Um, and now that you've even added like Hall of Fame and drinking and all these other sections to it, uh, yep. Um, which is great to see. It's like you got like a a big mountain to climb. Um. Yeah. And we add, you know, we add those things because frankly, I want to cheat and 101 doesn't feel like enough. So exactly. I, there, there, and there is so much to say that, that I don't feel guilty if people, you know, people care about being on the list list, but I'm excited to have other addendums like the hall of fame and like a drinks list because those places you should go to those places as well. Like, don't ignore them because we exactly. didn't put them on the on the main list. Well, and also, you know, um, you know, no, everyone who plays, no one thinks they're going to lose. And the, right. the flip side of the ranking is that, like, you know, I, I know, and I won't name the restaurant, but one one went dropped a hundred spots in a year. 
So it's like, so. <laughs> well, and, well, we mentioned it before this conversation. Yeah, 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 so. yeah, yeah. But yeah. I'm just saying like, that's yeah. the other side of the coin. So like Hall of Fame is like, it's that thing is people are like, come to LA, where do I want to eat? I was like, well, I could tell you where I'm eating right now. I could tell you that like, if you want my favorite new meal, it's Dunsmore. But if you like, want like yeah. a different experience, like, you know, go to ruined hair, you know, it's like, you know, or go here to SGV. Like, what do you want? Like, you know, do you want to go to Connie and Ted's for seafood? Do you want to go to Broad Street Oyster? Where are you staying in town? Yeah. And so, do you like, want to go to Fowl yeah. Oyster? Do you want to go to fishing? Fishing. fishing dynamite? Dynamite. Like, so it's just yeah. it's it's that thing of just where you go. Like, here here's the list. Here here's some staying power and things like that. But I will say, if you do want a good experience of eating in LA. The event on the 6th, on December 6th, where you announce yes. those and things like that, is yes. probably, like, the best catch-all to be, like, I'm going to try these restaurants. I'm going to get my, like, 15 to 20 spots of where I'm going to actually go and dine next year. And the list that you have of, you know, everyone from Cato uh, to Bridgetown Roadie, BC Clet, Safi's, Sonora Town, who, you know, I absolutely love. Like, it love really that. is such a great spread. Um, how much do you weigh in on picking these restaurants? How much does the list imply that? Like, talk to me about the event a little bit, um, which is when the, the list is really announced. Yeah, so um, you get to go to the the event. I don't get to go to the event. I mean, unless I just want to blow my anonymity altogether. But no, you yeah, put the hat on any... the glasses. That's what you do. You just talk <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not saying anything radical to you. I don't think by saying that, like, if somebody's cooking at that event, somebody's on the list. Sure. You know? So, sure. so that's you know that's and you know and it is a great. I'm I was happy with how the events people put together that list because I do see names that everyone recognizes and also a place like Pancho's Clayuda in yep. South LA, um, which is you know one of the top 10 dishes I would probably send somebody to try who is visiting Los Angeles. And I, I want more people to know about places like that. So, so I think it's a good breadth and I, I'm, I'm excited that the, the mix is there and it's, it's fun, you know, that it's out there as a preview, but I will say like, you know, we'll see what happens on the other side of this conversation you and I are having right now. Like, you know, pitchforks are always thrown and that's just the reality of, of being a critic. But yeah, some people are going to be like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 80, you know, screw you. And some people are like, that's number one. That's crazy. But, <laughs> but that's, I, but that's, I, I mean, you know, yeah. And not to I, go back to the I commercialism can, yeah. of it and like the, you know, the, the, the driving internet impressions and eyeballs and, and yeah. fostering chatter. It's like, that's you're going to get that more than just like, here's 101 restaurants that we really like. Like that's, that's the flip side of it. But I wonder if the same people who last year were lamenting the non-ranking post pandemic, they'll see where they are on the list. They'll be like, man, you know what? This isn't fair. We're still dealing with the pandemic. We should, I can't believe they're ranking. Um, oh, I'm look, sure. I, I'm ready I, for all of it. I'm ready for all of it. And look, I don't want to, I, and I, you brought it up already, so I can ask it without feeling a little weird. <laughs> okay. But the list isn't out yet. But you're already looking to 2023. What, you know, there's good momentum in the scene. There's obviously, you know, a better, like, you know, how it looks as like a cohesive unit um, because you have access to the list because you help put it together. But what are you looking for? What What are you hoping to see g- continue to grow and push forward, you know, at the end of this year and into next? I don't think we need any more restaurants in fancy hotels. I'm happy for those you, you LA know. chefs who who get good deals because we all we all need to to retire at some point in our lives. Yeah. So I don't begrudge anybody they, sure. them getting their nut, but also um, that's not what excites me. You know what excites me about Los Angeles is is the thing around the corner that you didn't expect. Mm. And um, I will say probably, you know, this this list doesn't reflect as much like super new restaurants. There are, 
You know, absolutely new restaurants that have opened this year. I would say a lot of them, I'm just thinking off the top of my head. So I don't, you know, I don't want this to be in. I mean, I'm sure I could name them for you of which new restaurant. I mean, Safi's, which is at the event. That's right, new. Safi's, which is at the event. I feel yeah. like a restaurant that starts with H is probably going to be on there as well. Um, uh, ga- galloping in oh, onto the list. Maybe, maybe, and maybe not. We'll see. Yeah. It's, uh, I know there's, there, sometimes they're just like complicated things to think through with restaurants, man. Yeah. And, uh, and if, yeah. if, yeah, so I don't know, again, it's part of the, the pandemic and the awareness of the moment. And it's sort of like, you know, so we'll, we'll, there, there'll be, it'll be fun. It'll be fun to see who's on there and who's not. And, and I think the thing that always say about that too, I know that this list comes out once a year. And so it kind of sits for Mm -hmm. these 12 months as this kind of, you know, I don't even know what the word is, but it just, this kind of guide um, that, that is meant to, to stay for the year. But I don't ever feel like this list is stagnant. So if some place that you're like, I can't believe you left that off this year, or it was on last year and it deserves to be on again. You know what? Maybe it will be on again next year. Maybe, you know, I went this year and I was like, something's off with this restaurant. And there's a reason that I I didn't feel good. Or maybe like you've expanded into so many locations that I'm giving a restaurant in a different genre that's totally up and coming a very, a, a chance to kind of shine in a way that you don't need to shine because everyone knows who you are. It's I mean, fun. they can't see me, but I'm I'm smiling because I feel like I know who you're referring to in that comment. Um, okay, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk. Right, we'll talk after I <laughs> after I stop recording. Uh, okay. And look, finally, it's the holiday season. We're three days away for Thanksgiving, but it's also going to be Hanukkah yeah. and Christmas and Kwanzaa and just people getting together. Um, I know you have a big music background, so instead of asking about what you're prepping, what are you listening to? What's the playlist? for for holiday season at your house yeah and i will say that that the holiday season is usually the only time that i really have an opportunity to actually like dig in dig in and cook anything of ambition yeah i do cook but it's all very like simple breakfast stuff so um what's on my playlist silk sonic Mm. yubba Mm. yubba yola amber mark 70s aretha Mm. Donny Hathaway, mid career Joni Mitchell. Hmm. Um, I'm a I'm a guy because I went to Berklee College of Music for singing. I I love 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 great voices in any genre, but I love the ones who really like transcend and are great singers. I I should just you know, however however this might be received, there is an incredible Streisand release um from earlier this month it's a live album of her singing in a new york nightclub in 1962 legendary 20 yeah no, it's, and no it's, matter it's your on it's worth a listen to understand the origins of that insane town i mean look my wedding song was uh her duet uh, happy days are here again that's what my wife and i first danced to duet um, with judy carlin yeah oh gosh we danced to that right into caribou can't do without you but uh happy days yeah. are here again is top five when i'm like like what is the what does this all mean put that she on you're like, that. Yeah, oh, yeah that's on oh. the playlist of this live album and it's like it's oh, radical yeah. to hear what this 20 year old voice was capable of it's crazy you know things come and go and you forget like what makes things a legend and then something comes out like that much like this list and you go like oh yeah that's where it ranks that's where it is in the pantheon uh, Bill, I cannot thank you enough. I know tickets are still available for the event on December 6th, but if people want to support the LA Times or check out the list, where can they go? How can they get uh, get involved with the community? Um, it is the, the list will go up on Tuesday, on the night of Tuesday, um, the 6th, December 6th. And you can probably just go to LA Times forward slash 101 list and and get info and I'm sure the night it comes out and there'll be print versions for subscribers that Sunday. And I think available in kind of a LA times print shop that we have, but yeah, pretty, it'll be pretty easy. I think to find that info on the, on the LA times homepage. 
Amazing. Well, Bill, I can't thank you enough. I'm super excited. I'll uh, I'll send you photos from the event. And um, please do. Uh, and let me know. Let me know what the word is. I'll I'll, I'll get the word because I I feel like uh, I feel like I can be like a good confidant for people. Be like, oh, how'd you feel? But um, how'd you do? And then we can, well, you know, on that Wednesday morning when all the chatter, when when all the all everyone's hungover in bed, they're just like. I can't believe in the cold light of morning where we are on this. Um, <laughs> yep. Thank you so much. Well, Thank you to everyone at the LA Times. Really appreciate it. We have another song from the archives and then a live performance here on Snacky Tunes on Heritage Radio. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Roberta's was founded in Bushwick in 2008 and has become one of the most iconic restaurants in the country. 
HRN made its home inside of Roberta's in 2009, and together they have become part of the DIY fabric of the neighborhood. Roberta's, the pizza restaurant, is open for lunch and dinner seven days a week and serves much more than just the famous wood-fired pizzas. Their team dreams up new salads, pastas, and sandwiches on the regular. Roberta's Tiki Bar is alive and well in the back garden, serving up frozen drinks in the summer and hot toddies in the winter. Stop by the bakery and takeout spot next door for fresh breads, sticky buns, and pizzas to go. And of course, there's the two Michelin-starred Blanca tucked away in the garden for truly daring diners. But Roberta's also extends beyond Bushwick, with multiple locations in New York City and now in Los Angeles. You can also find their frozen pies in grocery stores around the country. The spirit of Roberta's, like Heritage Radio Network, is everywhere. Here's to many more years of pizza-powered radio. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. So when you're on tours, it's mostly salads. I feel like... <laughs> no, but that, that's a fantasy. No. We wish it was all salads. Yeah. Yeah. It's still bread and cheese, man. Yeah, actually, I have a hilarious salad story about Annie. Mm. Okay. Um, this Love a good salad story. so Annie mm. that one... I mean, we, we have had to all share this hotel room in, in Paris one time. No, and, and okay, It was in Barcelona. Barcelona. Okay, okay. You, you know, I'm not really produce. good. Okay, There's amazing produce. Then. Okay, so she's obsessed. <laughs> okay. Annie is obsessed with produce. Like, she'll walk by a produce stand and be like, oh my God, oh my did God. you see that end? dive and we're like what are you talking about but like Eric and I, I, I were myself some produce. We, <laughs> and so did this one I do I like produce too but she gets like really excited about it and Eric and I were like dead <laughs> asleep and we wake up and we're like what is going on we just hear like banging it looked like someone had murdered someone in the bathroom yeah so we get up and we're like and we see Annie and there's just and the, no the, she was gone it was just she was, a remnant oh, she was of a gone. crazy salad that yeah. had been made in the all bathroom all over the bathroom she made a salad there were chopped beets, beets and chopped Are you carrots serious? shredded carrots she had it looked like it. bloody murder she had done it in the dark well she has we terrible sleeping. eyesight so she had taken <laughs> out her contacts <laughs> and off her glasses and proceeded to make a salad blind in the dark in, the dark okay. in a hotel it room was, it was dark i was starving i didn't want to wake you up That's so you decided consider. that beets were the way to go the no i found a towel I found. she got beets all I mean, over all the, the towels. towels okay so all then at your the guest towel. blog session we're gonna make the salad in the bathroom <laughs> yeah my other favorite thing to do is in italy uh-huh. Stop at a grocery store and get one of those, you know, one of those catering aluminum. Yeah, it's like yeah. what you, yeah. Yeah. Like what you roast the turkey in. Yeah, <laughs> and make a salad in that. Hell yeah! Because they have the best produce, yeah, and you can get fresh too. mozzarella, and you get what? I, what do you call the little the little guys? The baby arugulas, rucola. I yeah, don't know. the rocket, 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 mache, mache, oh mash, yeah, mash. mash. Oh, mm. the and then it's in like a giant bag with like you can fresh mozzarella is so cheap. You yeah. get like three balls. No, it's a, whole, there. it's a whole she's, other world. She's eaten a salad for for a whole family. Yeah. Before. Yeah. Well, whenever I blog about a salad and yeah. I, I have like a, a problem about, you know, when it, I have to give the serving size, if it's like how many people, and it's usually like three to four, four to five. But in reality, I just ate the whole thing myself. Yeah. No, it's, <laughs> serving sizes are so weird because they assume a lot of things. Yeah. I'm starting to think about salad Elaine. Thing. Like, did you get the big salad? Did you get the big salad? Yeah, I got the big salad. The big salad the big episode? Salad. Yeah. I don't think I've seen I don't that You one. never saw that episode? No. Oh, my God. Oh my God. This episode. Your yes. husband, oh, your husband is ashamed. Oh, right man. <laughs> It's all about. Isn't there also an episode where they make where Kramer makes salad, salad in, in the, the shower? shower. <laughs> yeah, wow. that's your Kramer, episode. Kramer. Oh my god, Annie is Kramer. It you suddenly Kramer. has dawned on she's Kramer. <laughs> I always thought she was Elaine, but no, we she's just I'm not. Kramer. Kramer. I'm trying to describe <laughs> Seinfeld to our Japanese record. <laughs> it's one of the funniest things. You know, some of those episodes, twenty years nothing. old, still stand up, make yeah, even yeah, more yeah. sense no. now. You that I'm in New York. Yeah, of course. I don't. I've always wondered how people who are not in New York watch it. I just gave a lecture about the Golden Girls in Hanoi, and I was like, "This is going to be rough," <laughs> and they totally got it. Really, you know, around trying to talk really about good Cuba. comedy. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It's like you don't even have to know what Miami is. What did you say it was about? You're like, it's about three old ladies, or what is four? Uh, four. Well, I kind of just like <laughs> skipped over the TV show and just showed the video, and like it was weird enough that everyone. I mean, every crazy old ladies exist everywhere. That's true. You know. In fact, um, let's play a song. Yeah. Okay. Let's okay. do a song, and then we'll talk about the new album. Fact. I'm Dorothy. You're Dorothy? <laughs> I, do they have anything like that where you can find out which golden girl you are? I'm sure they have I'm that. sure on BuzzFeed there's on something. On BuzzFeed. No. Like, which Seinfeld character We're you are? We're all a little bit of all of them. 
Oh. That's the point. We're all a little slutty. We're all a little ditzy. We're all a little alpha. Interesting. Yeah. Truth. Truth. Um, so what song are you going to play first? <laughs> it's called Just Like a Tree. It's about broccoli. <laughs> oh, broccoli. <laughs> broccoli salad. <laughs> oh, my God. You guys. Oh, my God. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, can you play this keyboard? Uh, if you move it this way. Okay, geez. All right, let's do All it. All right.
So uh, let's talk new album, uh, Movement Spectrums. Very uh, cool. I oh, like thank it. You. Thank you. Are you going to play Crazy Later? Uh, no, that one requires some instruments that we d- d- wouldn't be able to fit into this <laughs> small studio. <laughs> yes, I, I hope oh, that... Really? I thought we were playing it. No. Oh. We, we're using two, j- just so people know, we're using two ultra tiny keyboards right now and one drum machine. And this is like, I don't know, a it's tenth like of one, what we usually yeah, use. Tenth of our yeah. regular <laughs> but, um, I think the last time you played here, you shared one keyboard and had some finger symbols. Mm. <laughs> Those would be mine. That sounds like us. I, sh- I forgot my <laughs> finger symbols. Um, I forgot my fingers. You also asked us how we weren't fat from eating pizza every day. Mm. But you're only here once a week. Yeah, so, so that's hot. Um, so talk about the new album. I mean, it was, you had a little bit of a break in between this album and the previous one. And I feel like you're working on either solo records or children or things like that. Um, Our how inner the, children? What? Our inner children? Yeah. I and your you're yeah. outer one who's eating pizza in the other room. <laughs> um, so how did this one come to be? How, when did you decide that you wanted to make another another record? We started working on this album like summer of 2012 and some of the songs came together and then some of the other songs that came together were horrible and we didn't and never <laughs> saw the light of day. So and then um, after Heather graduated from her studies. Oh, yeah. We, what degree did you get? I got a degree in environmental biology from Columbia. Oh, Nerd. You're so I smart. Went to Columbia. <laughs> oh, you did? I just got my MFA there. Nice. Oh, yeah. Congratulations. Thanks. You too. Thanks. I, yours is more impressive. Not, <laughs> not really. <laughs> oh, an MFA. That's amazing. So, anyways. So, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, after she graduated, then we started like working on it full time. But it took about a year and a half, I guess, or a year to make it, a year and a half to make it. And it was definitely also like a conversation, like after Still Night, Still Light, we weren't really sure, you know, if we were going to make right. another album. Right. And and I think that we all just needed time to pursue like these other things we were really interested in because we had been a band for so long at that point. So um, there was a definite decision and a conversation of being like, you know, should we really do this? Do we have more to say? You know, what do we want to do this time? That's does different? anybody want to hear it? Does anyone, want, does anyone <laughs> care? Is anybody out there? <laughs> I would say yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's I've been really surprised. Like, not only have our crowds kind of retained the, the same people, but they're still telling all their friends to come to the shows. And it's it's really I find it an absolute honor to to be living this this life where we get to create what we're irresistibly and magnetically attracted to and then seeing firsthand the impact it has on other people's lives it's it's like nothing else it's really amazing um so the album how would you describe it in comparison to other albums though Everyone keeps saying that it's darker, but I find it like, so uh, hilarious because it's I like every single album we put out, they're like, this one's darker. So people, journalists <laughs> just really love to say It's that. also like, Williamsburg's really hot right now. Yeah, it's like, yeah. What's it like living there? <laughs> it has been 10 years of people being like, I Williamsburg's feel that this really one's hot right now. cheerier than other ones. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. We think so, too. Yeah. We think so, too. We think Still Night was kind of like a sad one, and this one's kind of more yes. poppy and fun. S- Still Night's a little bit of like a February album for me. Yeah. This one's more like a springtime. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And we always described it as still night was like our our sort of like five in the morning, like the stillness of the night. And this one's more like the 3 a.m. Yeah. Like 3 a. Da- a. You're still out time. dancing. When's the last time you were out 3 a.m. dancing? Last night. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah with Joe's band, that. right? Shout out, Joe. Hell yeah. Hey, Joe. Mm. Baby's all right. The new hot spot. It's great in there. Williamsburg's that place is really hot great. right now. That place is <laughs> awesome. What? They're so nice there too. Yeah, those guys are awesome. We we did a Halloween party there this year. It was Ooh. pretty spooky, scary stuff. Um, did you wear a costume? I was a tie dyed ghost. Oh, and that's so good. There that's were so it was good. a bed sheet. Okay, tie dyed, and there were three other tie dyed ghosts at the party. Cute. Coincidental? No, no, no. What? They all <laughs> they, we were all there together. Nice. And so. We didn't, and no one did really you, said anything. Did so you climb no on even, each other's shoulders at one point? No, because the bed sheets weren't even long enough to cover, like, mm. to cover me. But it was great. <laughs> too it much was, pizza. Uh, too much pizza. <laughs> okay. All right. So, <laughs> mommy's having a beer. Mommy's getting loose. <laughs> um, can we hear another song? Yes, this one is called Somebody Who. We have to. Start. I was going to be Bob Ross for Halloween. 
Uh, Wait, what happened? Best idea ever. I couldn't find an Afro wig. Oh, come on. You couldn't find one Afro wig? What about that giant Halloween store on, that was open on Union? Yeah, Ricky's has got to have an Afro wig. Yeah. I was in Chicago at the time. Oh, okay. So wait, who needs a microphone? I think we're good. Okay, we're good. all right, we're here good. we go. I'll wear some own. up here. Okay, ready. So good. That was really good. Thank you. Henry, thoughts? Yeah, Henry. Do you like that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's so awesome to have you girls back. I had a really good time at the at the Brooklyn Bazaar, Night Bazaar show. Yeah, that was that fun. Was awesome. You guys were really rocking out. Cool. I also liked your side ponytail. Mm. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I had a hairstyle change in the middle of the set, which was a first for me. It was it was um a suggestion by a friend of mine. It's She's good. an artist. So. She's an artist. A lot of artists. Shows are. I feel like these shows, our episodes are better when we have artists. Same, just like Saturday Night Live when they have real artists. Like if you haven't seen the Drake episode yet, it's. I'm so excited. Oh my god, Annie. Really Annie, excited. the Drake episode of Saturday Night Live might be the best episode in a long time. Do you want to comment? Do you like Drake? That's like the biggest understatement. All Annie talks about is Drake, like all the time. Are you familiar with his early canon as Jimmy on, from Degrassi? I, I, I kind of got into it on tour. I started YouTubing it, but 
I was only interested in the Drake scenes and the rest of it was really dragging, so I kind of <laughs> dropped the ball. Yeah. Sorry. It's, it's cool. It's too Canadian. It's, too it's so Canadian. <laughs> well, I mean, we, my brother and I grew up watching it's that stuff. It's clearly Canadian. You did, yes. When we go up to Montreal, we'd watch oh, cool. the original Degrassi. And we're like, oh. what is this? <laughs> it's, it's real life. It's real life coming at you fast. Yeah. Uh, so what's up next? So now the album's out. Yeah, we have been touring. We just got back from Japan. We're about uh, to go to Europe. And then we're That's opening amazing. for this awesome band, Broken Bells. <laughs> oh, yeah. Broken Bells are great. They're so great. Um, I really loved your tour photos from Japan on, on my Instagram. It's hilarious over there. Which one did you like? Um, the one of the shops. Uh, hmm. I have to go back and look. Yeah, you're probably <laughs> Don't right. put them on the spot. <laughs> I, mean, I, I was just the day. curious because a lot of them were just pictures of us on stage, and I was like, "Wow!" No, you had some nice, you, you had some nice uh, scenics, if you will, of Japan. That's mm. that's uh, I think number one on my top travel list. We took some beautiful train rides. Yeah. Did you go to any onsen? We did. We did. Not like well, not like natural onsens, but some bathhouses. Yeah. We went to one for five hours. It was like we, our entire day off. It was so lo- was lovely. All the Japanese people were like, you're going for five hours? <laughs> I'm sorry. For those who don't know what we are talking about. Okay. <laughs> it's like a bath, like a public bathhouse. And it's okay. not super, it's not like fancy. It's just a place where people go to like steam. Ooh. There's the one that we really love called Heaven Baths. There's a sake bath. Where it's not oh. all sake, but it has sake in it, and you steam in this in this wooden tub. There's like four wooden tubs. In it a row. smells really good. But like, they often have natural spring water. That's yeah, yeah. yeah. That's there was bad. one that was like a mineral bath, but we, of course we can't understand like what, what any of the, the signs say. And the funny thing is, like the sauna has this giant flat screen TV, and everyone's just like watching this. Like, and it's not even like <laughs> calm spa laughing. stuff. It's like. This woman is crying, and there's, yeah. like, a car accident. Like, you're like, you're watching really this hyper. in a hot tub? We got massages yeah. in Thailand. The guy next to me was watching Fight Club on his iPhone with, like, the loudest, oh my God. Wow. IPad, the loudest <laughs> volume. That's awful. With just a curtain between us. You should have asked him to pay for your massage. Well, I think if you do it twice a day, then you can watch Fight Club. That's true. You're yeah. not, like, treating yourself. Massages yeah. twice a day. They're, like, Thailand. a dollar. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I got, when wow. I was in, uh... Vietnam, I got like a massage on the beach from like four women, and it was like five bucks. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> wow. They also tried to um, hair twine oh. my back, and I was like, no, 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 no. Oh my god! <laughs> but they just started, and I was like, how oh, that really hurts? Yeah. Uh, no, but like, <laughs> I had <laughs> one very uh, smooth shoulder. Wow. Not that I have a lot of hair, but it's just like I was like, what are you doing? But yeah, it's great. Yeah. Asian massages. Yeah. Yeah, on, we were on in Hong level. Kong and we all got massages for like ten dollars. Oh yeah, that's right. <sighs> this must be so awesome traveling, playing music with your best friends. Yeah. It's great. It is fun. Do you get to bring Henry? Um, yeah, we're we're going to Europe on February third. We're starting a big run, and um, we're doing a string of dates in the south of France. So Doug and Henry are going to come. And we're going to go hang out. Awesome. In some lavender fields or something. Hope he doesn't trash the, the green room. I hope he does. <laughs> I hope he does, because we are like we have a really good reputation, and I'm tired of it. You're tired of it. <laughs> you tired of being professional? We're just so nice, and we care. We show up on time. How many different dresses do you bring on tour? Three. Three outfits is the perfect amount. Really? I because bring then, more than then that. Then there's like no. You don't have to think about it. But how many do you wear? Like one. You end up wearing about three, no matter how many you bring. And you just rotate them out. Yeah. Are these performance dresses or just day dresses? Well. They're not always dresses. I would say that sometimes I wear pants and a tie. That makes me want to pinch his cheeks. (laughs) Day dresses. I don't know. I mean, you are not. You are not. Out, out, you yes. know about day dresses. You're known for your stylish. You guys don't even know the difference between dresses and skirts. You're really know, showing like something special. Here. I uh, work at a you fashion sisters. company now. Yeah. I work at a fashion company. Oh, I know. Oh, what are we talking? Minis, pencils. What are we talking? <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so this has been another awesome show. We have enough time for one more song. Um, <laughs> But thank you so much for everybody. Me, Julia, thank you. Thank you. Adam for finding the beer. Henry for playing the keyboards during all the interviews. Oh, thanks, Henry. Shout out to Bouncing Souls forever. And ever. East Coast Hardcore. (laughs) For life. For life.
Um, where can people find the album, all the nuts and bolts of... We have... Uh, our, we're, we try to be act, semi-active on our Facebook page. And then we have a website that's slightly informational and has a shop. And then... There's um, iTunes. There's always iTunes and all of the regular music retailers. And we have some really fun music videos. So definitely check out our YouTube. And um, yeah, please, like, you know, we like to meet people and mix it up. So tweet at us, find us on Instagram, follow our tour that we're about to do. And, and it's, all, uh, it's all your band name. Oh. Yeah, Au revoir, Simone. Do you want to spell that for all the people? A U R E V O I R. S I M O N E. And it's a, a quote from Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Mm-hmm. Yes. Which I remember my good buddy Luke when he found that out. Was, remember that? Was he was psyched. Yeah. Was super psyched. <laughs> um, well, thank you to everybody. I, I'm not sure if we're going to be on next week because it's the Super Bowl and if people are going to be around. But I feel like the Super Bowl starts super late. I have no idea. Is that really Even your though competition? Even the Broncos though? are. What? Super Bowl is really your competition? No, it's not. I don't know. I would do a show during Super Bowl. I, it's we we just have to have we just have to see, um, it's you know things it's in New York this year, so I, <laughs> I feel like it's gonna be crazy. It's gonna be crazy, and the you Broncos are playing. I'm from Colorado, so it's just oh yeah, mm-hmm. is that where Denver is? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> should we play uh, something else? It should be good. Oh, we're having a band meeting right now. Yeah, we're trying to decide. So what we, should we play? We we That's were gonna play an oldie. We oh. were going to play an oldie, but now we're thinking, I think, do you think it's too much of a lullaby? Or that's what we're going for? I think that it's I mean, I think you got to end with energy. You know, your best songs have to be your first song and your last song. I see, tell me if you guys were going to play on one Do you keyboard. want me to play crazy and try and do it? Yeah, well, uh, let's, do it. Crazy. let's do it. It's a single, and I'll I love just, it. I'll beatbox the bass. This might oh, be terrible. This how, really this might be terrible. How could anything that you three do be terrible? We've never tried to do it like lo-fi like this. Yeah, you know, we haven't. Well, that's uh, that's why the magic happens in the shipping and training. No, I have just played bass. Hmm. You don't have a bass, do you? I don't, but you can still feel free to make a bass face, even though you're not playing it. Make the bass. How's your bass face? Oh, that's that's not a fun bass face. Um, all right, here we go. Uh, Avar Simone. Is this the best sound, Annie? There's a, yeah, sure. Pipe organ. Do do. Okay. Do you need another microphone? No. Henry, you want to get on here? Henry no, loves this song. Henry, you want to sing it? He's got good taste. Aww. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Hopefully, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Uh, I guess go Broncos. Thanks so much. Or whatever. Thank you so much. Go everybody. salad. Yeah. Every time I walked away, I thought that it was done And every try I made became the one I counted on You knew me when I loved to lose and to lose again Seems we're either giving up or giving in But ooh, you girls, you drive me crazy Ooh, you girls, you drive me crazy
Snacky Tunes is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.